to my panel. Thanks to you for watching. I'm Paul Jago. Hope to see you right here next week. And to start with the Fox News alert, Democratic Senator Al Franken breaking his silence for the first time since he was accused of inappropriately touching women. In an interview with Minnesota Public Radio, Senator Franken apologized to his accusers and he says he will focus on helping victims of sexual harassment. Did you put your hand uh, again, on someone's rear end during a photo shoot? I would never intentionally do that. And so, uh, but that does not negate my intention isn't what is important. What is important is um, we, we have to listen to women and respect um, what they say. He is defending himself, but will it save his political career? Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Sean. This is America's News Headquarters. And I'm Arthel Neville. Senator Franken will return to the Senate tomorrow and likely facing an ethics investigation, which he himself has invited. Now, he's not the only lawmaker on Capitol Hill accused of sexual misconduct. Embattled Congressman John Conyers, the top Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee, announcing today he will resign from that post amid claims he sexually harassed female staffers. The congressman has already been the subject of an ethics probe. Molly Hinneberg joining us live now in Washington with more. Molly? Hi, Arthel. Democratic Senator Al Franken says he'll be back to work tomorrow, that this has been embarrassing and a, quote, shock to him that women have accused him of groping them. As you heard, Franken says he does not remember grabbing the women who say he harassed them. Four of them have come forward so far. But while Franken says he will go along with an ethics investigation, he's not leaving the Senate. No, the ethics committee is looking into all this, and I will cooperate fully with it. Listen, I know I have a lot of work to do to regain the trust of people I've let down. Um, the people of Minnesota, my, my, my friends and supporters and my colleagues, and especially everyone who counts on me to be a champion and ally of, of women. Michigan Democratic Congressman John Conyers, who House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi today described as a, quote, icon, who's done, quote, a great deal to protect women, said today that he will be stepping down as the top Democrat on the powerful House Judiciary Committee as an ethics investigation looks into sexual harassment allegations and payments to keep those allegations secret. Conyers said in a statement, quote, I'm grateful to my colleagues who have called for due process before weighing judgment. I would urge them to continue to do so for any member accused of wrongdoing. Basic fairness requires no less. Meanwhile, President Trump is urging Alabama voters not to vote for Doug Jones, the Democrat in the special Senate election on December 12th. The Republican in the race is Roy Moore, who's been accused of sexual misconduct with teenagers when he was in his 30s. Today, Trump tweeted, quote, the last thing we need in Alabama and the U.S. Senate is a Schumer Pelosi puppet who is weak on crime, weak on the border, bad for our military and our great vets, bad for our Second Amendment, and wants to raise taxes to the sky. Jones would be a disaster. But other Republicans are hesitant to back more. The other alternative is if Roy Moore wins and he comes into the Senate in January, there's going to immediately be an ethics investigation, which is going to be a cloud uh, that he'll be operating in. And Senator Thune wants the president to use his influence to get Moore to step aside so that Alabama voters could write in another candidate. Arthel? Molly Hinneberg. Thank you, Molly. Eric? Or the holiday weekend, well, it's wrapping up this afternoon, and the president soon will be taking off from Palm Beach International Airport, of course, bound back to Washington. That is where some pressing issues are awaiting, including the critical tax reform vote and a spending deadline. Phil Keating is live in West Palm Beach, Florida now, near the president's Mar-a-Lago estate, with the very latest on how did the president and the family spend the Thanksgiving break. Well, a lot of golfing every single day, and of course, they had a big Thanksgiving dinner with all of your traditional items on the menu. But the president did have some presidential work that he accomplished from Mar a Lago, making a couple of international phone calls one to the president of Turkey, another one to the president of Egypt, that one uh, offering condolences for that horrible, deadly attack. Uh, it's been a fifth straight day of golfing for the president. He's back at Mar a Lago right now with the first family and First Lady Melania's parents. and. 
We think they are in the last few minutes of enjoying their home there before they hop into the motorcade and make their way really only about a three or five minute drive to the West Palm Beach International Airport where Air Force One has been parked since Tuesday. But sometime this hour, we fully expect Air Force One to take off and depart and bring the president and his family back to Washington. And it's going to be a very busy week back up in Washington. We can start with what's happening on Tuesday. For the very first time, the president is going to be joining the GOP policy lunch, which happens every single week, but this will be the first time he attends in person. Clearly, they're going to be talking cat tax cuts and tax reform. Senate leaders hope they can get their bill to a floor vote, perhaps as early as this week. That's happening on Tuesday, and then Tuesday night or afternoon, the big four legislative leaders will meet with Trump at the White House to hammer out a way to avoid a December government showdown. The federal budget's going to run out of money December 8th. But as the president told the troops on Thanksgiving, his top priority in December is this. Now we're working on tax cuts, big, fat, beautiful tax cuts. And hopefully we'll get that, and then you're going to really see things happen. It is going to get done. It has to get done for the American people. It's less about the politics of the timing. It's more about that this president's begun to turn this economy around. Like I said, the Trump, uh, the president has uh, hit one of the Trump golf courses here in the area around West Palm Beach every single day that he has been here. On Friday, he had quite the legendary foursome. Him, Tiger Woods, number one of the world, Dustin Johnson, and PGA Pro Brad Faxon. That was at Trump National in Jupiter. So, what's it like to play 18 holes with the president? Intimidating? Not at all. Faxon writing this for GolfWeek.com saying they played a casual round of best ball. Trump's a fun guy to joke around with, he said. You would think you'd have to tiptoe around a bit with the president, but he immediately puts you at ease. The president was gracious and entertaining. He told some stories, things he loves about the job, and things he doesn't love. Again, sometime this hour, and we're expecting here in just a few minutes, the motorcade heading back over to the airport so that the president and his family can end this very long and lovely weather-filled extended Thanksgiving holiday break here on Palm Beach and then head back to D.C., arriving probably around sunset. Yeah, back right, to you, we're, we're bringing that to you when it happens. Phil, thank you. Great to be a bug on the wall or, a, right. you know, fly in the green to find out what that conversation was about. Thank you. Wouldn't it be? Wouldn't <laughs> it be? Yeah. Right, Thel? And as we mentioned, it is crunch time this week for Congress, not just trying to cross tax reform off their to-do list, but also passing a funding bill to avoid a government shutdown. We need to pass a long-term spending bill, uh, obviously, in the legislative process, the negotiation that will go on uh, between the White House and, and uh, uh, Democrats in Congress and our leadership in Congress. Is sometimes you need to do a short-term extension, but ultimately we need to do a bill that funds the government through the end of the next fiscal year and that addresses the important priorities that we need to address. There shouldn't be any discussion about shutting down the government. Uh, we can make this thing work. President Trump is scheduled to have a working lunch with Senate Republicans on Tuesday. Caroline Shively has more now in Washington. Sometimes Congress just creaks along at a slow pace, and sometimes they ran things through at lightning speed. Judging by their agenda, Republican leaders are planning on some lightning. In the next few weeks, they may vote on taxes, the individual mandate, health care for kids, sexual harassment, and oh yeah, the entire federal government will shut down if they don't pass a spending resolution. The Senate votes on tax reform this week. The House has already passed its version. I predict we will have a new tax code for the new year and for a new era of American prosperity. We deserve it. Americans deserve a new tax code. They are doing something that's going to increase the debt enormously. We're, it's going to be a job, a, kill, a job killer, and it's going to raise taxes on the middle class. And that is, has a big impact on the individual lives of all Americans. Democrats are pushing to amend the spending bill, allowing dreamers to stay. Those are illegal immigrants who came here as minors. Republicans want it handled separately. We have uh, a fixable priority in the DREAM Act, a bipartisan solution to this problem to make sure that these young people have a chance to earn their way into citizenship. We can do this, and we can get it done before the end of the year. But it shouldn't be dealt with in the context of a year-end spending bill and, and the Democrats using it and trying to use leverage to, uh, as a, you know, to shut down the government. That's not how this ought to be resolved. 
Republican leaders say they aren't afraid to keep members here past their scheduled holiday break to finish their work. Arthel? Caroline Shively, thank you. Well, the latest developments in the Russian investigation now. You know, there have been a lot of questions raised and speculation about whether or not General Michael Flynn is or could potentially be cooperating with prosecutors. You know, last week we learned that attorneys for the former National Security Advisor, well, they had cut off communication with President Trump's legal team. So analysts say that could mean Flynn is cooperating with special counsel Robert Mueller or trying to strike a deal. Here is former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Preet Bharara. A lot of the reporting suggests that Michael Flynn has a considerable amount of exposure based on his dealings with Russia and not disclosing some of those dealings. And if all of that is true, and he has considerable legal liability, criminal liability, then the way to get yourself off the hook, and in his case, not only himself, but potentially also his son, who's involved in some of this, the only way to do that is to cooperate with the prosecution. So what is going on behind the scenes? Garrett Tenney now live in Washington. So Garrett, first of all, how's the president's legal team responding uh, to, you know, Flynn's uh, basically putting the wall up? Well, Eric, this is something that they have been expecting would eventually happen. For months, Michael Flynn's attorneys, they have had an information sharing agreement with President Trump's legal team, and that's fairly normal for defense attorneys to do in these large criminal investigations. But when one side decides to cooperate with investigators, that communication stops, and this week, General Flynn's attorney made it known that they would no longer be able to share information about the investigation. Jay Sekulow, a member of the Trump legal team, said the prospect of Flynn entering a plea is not unexpected, and no one should draw the conclusion that this means anything about General Flynn cooperating against the president. Instead, they believe any charges against Flynn will likely be related to his lobbying work on behalf of Turkey and have nothing to do with the president or with Russia. Some legal experts are also suggesting that even if Michael Flynn had any damaging evidence against the president, there are real questions about his credibility. Given the potential charges against Flynn, including false statements, you know, his credibility is suspect. And I'm not trying to run down a guy who served this country for years, but ultimately when you have to look at this as a prosecutor, to put him on the witness stand against those charges, they're going to need some real corroborating evidence to support his testimony going forward if he agrees to cooperate. And throughout this investigation, General Flynn has been very concerned about his son, whom he worked very closely with and has also now become a target of this investigation. Eric? Yeah, Michael Flynn Jr. Uh, uh, certainly was defending his father on, on Twitter. Uh, meanwhile, you mentioned his lobbying work. Uh, that also uh, potentially is expanding the investigation of that? Yeah, his consulting and lobbying work on behalf of Russia and Turkey has long been a, fo a focus and a point of interest for investigators. So while Michael Flynn was campaigning with President Trump, he was reportedly paid more than a half million dollars by the Turkish government. The Wall Street Journal reports that work included an unfinished documentary targeting a moderate Muslim cleric living in the U.S. who is a political rival of Turkey's president. Investigators are now looking into who Flynn worked with on that film, who was involved in the project, to see if there is any further evidence to suggest Flynn was hiding his work and those payments from federal investigators. Eric? All right, Garrett. Thank you. Arthel? And Eric, speaking of Russia, a congressional committee wants something from the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. And Kushner has until tomorrow to provide it. Daniel Halper, contributing editor for the Washington Free Beacon, joins us next to talk about that. Plus, a deadly explosion leveling buildings and leaving streets full of debris. Where this catastrophic blast happened, we'll show you. Also, a massacre at a mosque in Egypt now drawing people together to denounce terrorism, even as ISIS tries to increase its influence in that region. We know that ISIS Sinai wants to carry out attacks across Egypt. They'd like to unravel Egypt. They'd like to see civil war. Egypt is the big prize for them. 97 million people. They'd love to get a foothold. Well, two people were killed. At least 30 others were injured in a factory explosion near Shanghai. That blast knocked out several nearby buildings and left the streets littered with debris. It happened in the port city of Ningbo. Those buildings, fortunately, were empty at the time. You know, China frequently suffers fires and industrial accidents. They are often blamed on negligence. But the cause of this explosion is currently under investigation. 
Tomorrow marks the deadline for President Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner to turn over documents to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The panel, which is investigating Russian meddling in the presidential election, recently sent a letter to Kushner's attorney requesting emails that lawmakers say Kushner had withheld on WikiLeaks and Russia. This comes as two new reports emerge claiming Kushner's position in his father-in-law's administration could be shrinking. Joining me now is Daniel Helper, contrib contributing editor for the Washington Free Beacon. Good to see you, Daniel. Good afternoon. All righty. So here we have the Judi Judiciary Committee asking for specific documents. I mean, his lawyers have said they've already submitted necessary documents as it pertains to this Russian investigation. Does Kushner's team have any wiggle room to interpret what they deem necessary to submit? Well, clearly they have, and they've been doing it all along, and they've submitted some stuff, and the Judiciary Committee comes back and says, no, we want more. But they have documents from other people and other other sources people under investigation that they're able to cross-reference and, and are, can go back. I think this is a very normal process in an investigation and nothing perhaps to worry about for Jared Kushner by itself. But just being the center of this investigation and of the Robert Mueller investigation, of the House Intel investigation, I think that is much more worrisome for Jared than just this, you know, sort of routine document request. How so? Because it, it's a, basically a cancer sort of on the White House itself. They, it's very intrusive. It takes a lot of time. It sucks a lot of energy. And by the way, there might be indictments coming down later for, for some of these people in the White House from Robert Mueller. And so I think just the, having that down your neck, I think it really has prevented the White House from being as effective as they might have been all throughout the, uh, President Trump's first year. And how much confidence and trust does Kushner and his team have in the court of public opinion? So I don't think the court of public opinion matters too much for Jared Kushner because he's, uh, by marriage, very, very close to President Trump. And there's these two articles today, in the Was one in the Washington Post and one in the New York Times, mm -hmm. that basically say that he's a dead man walking, that he has no relation. I think that that's, that's vastly overstate overstated. I think he still is very close to President Trump. I think he has learned in, in, his, in the first year in the White House to dial back some of his ambitions and perhaps operate in a more... Uh, try to keep a lower profile and try to keep a tighter lid on what he's doing. But I don't think that that means that he doesn't have power, doesn't have the ability to go to President yeah. Trump. I think he does. And I think that these articles, I think on the one hand, they're right that, that John Kelly, the White House chief mm -hmm. of staff, has restructured the White House. Right. So but that on the means other Jared, hand, like everybody else, has to go through John Kelly to have an official access, if you will, to the president. But you're right. Jared Kushner still has the family all access pass to the president. Exactly. And I think that's the key. Uh, I think that's more important than anything else. And I think this investigation, look, everybody, including President Trump, has to deal with this investigation. Nothing's going to change with that. That's just going to be a cancer on, the, on this White House going forward. I think the key for this administration is whether they can put blinders on, focus on the task at hand, get their agenda through without having this bog down, bog them down too much more than it already has. And we know that uh, from learning mainly from the campaign and, and throughout this entire first year, Jared Kushner is still one of the president's top confidants. He probably still maintains that role. And I'd imagine, and I don't want to speculate here, but I think it's safe to bet that, uh, in fact, the president is very much behind his son-in-law and will do whatever it takes to protect him. Certainly. And, I mean, that doesn't mean that they don't have their own disagreements. I think at times they do, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's normal. I think, as anybody knows, coming off of Thanksgiving weekend, that having disagreements within your family can be normal. That doesn't mean that you, that, that you aren't close. And I think they do have a closeness that has benefited uh, both of them. So as onlookers try to analyze every step in this Russia probe, what can we expect to happen tomorrow and after these additional Kushner documents have been submitted? So I think the actual handing of the, over the documents won't won't be anything. It will either be done electronically or via courier, but it won't it won't be any sort of scene. I think the problem is is that we don't know what to expect, right? So if you're the Trump White House and you're trying to plan, you don't really know when the next letter, when the next inquiry, when the next interview, when the next indictment is going to come. And I, that's going back to what I said previously. That's the problem. It just it, it's this factor that you can't account for throughout the throughout the legislative or throughout whatever agenda you're trying to uh, 
push. You can't account for that, like the Michael Flynn news that came over the weekend that he may be cooperating with investigators. You just can't count on those things. And I think just the uncertainty of it all is, is really what's problematic. Yeah, the unknown is daunting. Daniel Halper, we leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our Thalmi, well overseas, we're learning more about that devastating attack on the crowded mosque in Egypt. How the country's neighbors are sending a strong message to those terrorists who are behind that horrible act. Plus, conservatives have been reacting after President Trump doubles down in his support of Roy Moore in the Alabama Senate election. This is Congress now faces growing pressure to make major reforms in how it deals with allegations of sexual harassment under its own roof. This is all about politics, and that's why when politicians talk about this, um, it doesn't have a lot of credibility. This has been going on in politics for a very long time. Democrats try and defend their own. Republicans try and defend their own. Show. Had the information been released, there would have been harm to national security. As a federal watchdog, he knew everything about the classified documents. Now, Monday, Charles McCullough speaks out for the first time inside the real risks of her private server and the personal threats if Hillary was held accountable. But we would be the first two to be fired uh, with her administration. Now, hear it all. What should the American public know about those 22 top secret Clinton emails? The exclusive interview you can't afford to miss only on Tucker Carlson tonight. Well, as the Alabama special Senate election nears, the calls from within the GOP for Republican candidate Roy Moore to drop out, well, they've continued after the series of sexual misconduct allegations against him. But you know, Moore is determined to stay in the race against Democrat candidate Doug Jones. President Trump has also been looking for a more victory there as he continues his Twitter attacks on Jones, calling Jones, quote, weak puppet of Senate Minority Leader Charles Schumer and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. And that appears to be now opening a rift within the party. Here's Republican Senator John Thune earlier today on Fox News Sunday. The president obviously can speak for himself, but, and I think he sees the, the specter of a Democrat holding that seat and what that might mean for his agenda, but the alternative, as I said, isn't good either, Chris. And so, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the president, uh, to the degree that he wants to use his influence in this race, uh, could, uh, I think, uh, help everybody out by doing what he can to try and get Roy Moore to step aside. So, what can we expect, Marianne Rafferty now, in Los Angeles, with more on this race? So, first, Marianne, uh, how confident is the Democrat, Doug Jones, uh, today that he can actually defeat Roy Moore on December 12th. Hi, Eric. Well, one thing's for certain, Doug Jones didn't waste a good opportunity to talk to voters just before Auburn pulled off a big win against the Crimson Tide. The Democrat was busy campaigning tailgate style. He was using the big Iron Bowl rivalry to remind voters that he needs their support to score his own win against his rival, Roy Moore. I think we're going to win. That's all I know. Uh, we've got a really great, uh, uh, I mean, there are just thousands of supporters that have come out to work for this campaign. We've been talking about all the issues that matter to people from the day, day one. You get sidetracked on other things, but we've been talking about the economy. We've been talking about health care. Those are the issues that people care about the most, and it's, and it's resonated with us. And Alabama native Charles Barkley voicing his support for Jones and expressing his thoughts on more even before sexual assault allegations ever surfaced. We got a lot of black people in the state who are amazing people, but to run a campaign with a guy as your chief advocate who is a white nationalist, a white separatist, that should have disqualified Roy Moore way before this women stuff came up. Now, Barkley never fully endorsed Jones, but as you saw there, he did make his opinion very clear, Eric. Yeah, that's for sure. And meanwhile, as we've seen some razor-thin votes in the Senate, how could a Doug Jones win uh, impact the balance of power there? 
Well, Eric, if Jones wins, it would mean an even narrower margin for Republicans in the Senate, which currently stands at 51 to 49. But despite what happens in the battle for the Alabama Senate seat, Republicans are forging on, hoping to push through the tax reform bill before the end of this year. President Trump also weighing in on the importance of this race, tweeting earlier today, I endorsed Luther Strange in the Alabama primary. He shot way up in the polls, but it wasn't enough. Can't let Schumer Pelosi win this race. Liberal Jones would be bad. Bad. Meanwhile, we haven't seen much of Republican Senate candidate Roy Moore the past couple of days in the wake of the allegations against him by several women. But he does have plans to hold a rally tomorrow in Fort Payne, Alabama. Now, this will be the first one since November 16th when he didn't allow any questions about the allegations against him. We'll see if he addresses those allegations this time around. Eric? All right, Marianne. Thanks so much. Arthel. Palestinian standing with Egypt as it reels from an assault on a mosque that killed more than 300 people, the deadliest terror attack in modern Egyptian history. Here's what it looked like in the West Bank, Palestinians showing solidarity with the victims and sending a message of defiance to those responsible. The Palestinian figures and factions who are coming today to show their sympathy with the families and to send their condolences to the families of the victims, but at the same time to have a stand against the terror which is trying to shake Egypt. Connor Powell has the latest now from Jerusalem. Connor. Yeah, Arthel, Paris and Tel Aviv, also two cities paying tribute to the victims of Friday's attack in the Sinai Desert in Egypt. Now, we're also beginning to learn a little bit more about what led up to this attack that took place Friday during afternoon prayers at a fairly small mosque in the Sinai Desert town of Bir al Abed. Now, this is a small town, only a couple thousand people, and there were about 500 or so people in this uh, mosque praying when uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 militants pulled up. They set off a bomb outside the mosque and then uh, taking positions around the mosque began firing at uh, the worshippers as they were trying to flee to safety, killing more than 300 people, injuring another hundred or so, many of them children, in fact, as well. Uh, authorities in Egypt say that this mosque, which was a Sufi mosque, which is a tolerant, very moderate form of Islam uh, that is very much despised by militant groups and extremists like ISIS and al-Qaeda, uh, that they had been working and cooperating with uh, Egyptian officials to try to stamp out extremism in that area. And ISIS in the last several weeks had come to the leaders of that community telling them to stop working and to stop communicating and cooperating with Egyptian officials there or there would be some type of attack. And according to witnesses, they say that the gunmen who launched this attack on Friday were flying ISIS banners and were very much a part of an affiliate ISIS group that runs and has wrecked, wreaked havoc all around the Sinai in recent weeks. Now, the uh, Egyptian military launched a series of airstrikes in retaliation to this attack in the mountainous region of Sinai. It's not really clear what the target was, nor if they were at all successful or not, but uh, Egyptian President uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has vowed to make sure that this attack does not go unpunished. But this is a vow, Arthel, that uh, Sisi has made several times. And we have seen in the last two to three years just a wave of violence carried out by ISIS. And the Egyptian government really has been unable and un, uh, uh, unable to stop these attacks. And there are questions in Egypt about just how much of a commitment there is on the ground to really take it to ISIS in the Sinai. That is a, a serious problem for the Egyptian government right now, that there is both the inability and the perception that they may not be doing enough to tackle ISIS there, Arthel. Yeah, and whether or not they will ask for help where they can get it. Connor, thank you. A delay. Well, for more on this, let's bring in Ambassador Dennis Ross, former Special Middle East Coordinator, Fox News Foreign Affairs Analyst, and author of Doomed to Succeed, the U.S.-Israeli Relationship from Truman to Obama. Uh, Ambassador, I mean, the hatred is just incomprehensible. And as we heard from Connor just now, can you describe the depth of opposition by the jihadis and the, the radicals against the more moderate Sufis? The... the uh the jihadis, the al-Qaeda, ISIS, basically reject the idea of the other, and they especially reject the idea of the other when there are Sunni Muslims who seem to embrace it. A Sufi Islam is really a more mystical form of Islam, 
It has shrines to saints, which is a little different than is the norm. Uh, they're viewed as kind of intermediaries with the prophet. Uh, and from the standpoint of the radical Islamists, they take this as being a form of rejection of Islam. And it becomes, in a sense, an excuse for them uh, to go after what I call the other. The problem with the radical Islamists uh, is that basically they treat anyone who they consider to be the other as fair game to kill. Uh, what makes them so unacceptable is that basically their whole ideology is an ideology of power and control but exclusion and intolerance uh, and basically one frequently of murder. And the other, as you so uh, point out, could be infidels. Uh, certainly Christians, the Coptic Christians, who've seen the attacks on, on Christian churches, and also so sadly, you know, on themselves, you know, on the, yes. on the, the, the fellow, fellow members of the fellow religion. This goes back centuries. What we're seeing is that, unfortunately, ISIS and Al-Qaeda ultimately tend to make other Muslims uh, the victims. Uh, it's not just that they will carry the attack outside of the region, but you look at all the attacks that they've carried out inside the region, and if you look at the actual number of people who've been killed, most of those who've been the victims of their violence uh, and their assaults have been other Muslims. So then where is the outrage? Where are the public calls against this, you know, from, from the mosque? Are they that? Are they? Or are there the uh, elements within that religion who have been trying to defeat this? We saw what's happening in Saudi Arabia. Uh, basically, right. it, that's kind of like a revolution to support moderates there. It is. And what's interesting is uh, we saw a couple of things. You had the early report on Palestinians coming out. But today in the Sinai, thousands of students came out. Uh, to condemn what had happened in March, something you really haven't seen before. Uh, you had a gathering today in Saudi Arabia of the coalition to counter radical extremism, uh, and the crown prince there made a point of emphasizing uh, the solidarity and the need to respond to this, but also to condemn those within, uh, those who define themselves as radical Islamists, to condemn them and to condemn what they represent, that they don't represent the religion, they represent a perversion of the religion. It may well be that these kinds of actions can galvanize the kind of broader uh, Middle East to begin to focus much more on discrediting radical Islamists. Uh, Islam is a religion. It's a faith. Islamism is an ideology. And the radical Islamists are pursuing that ideology of power and control and exclusion uh, and discrediting them. You can't just defeat them through military means. They have to be discredited. Those in the West can't discredit them. It has to come from those in the Middle East, those who are Sunni Muslims. They're the ones who can say this is a perversion uh, of our faith, and in fact that they are enemies of our faith. We certainly hope that the Sunnis, you know, do, do, do that. I mean, rise up. And you mentioned the West can't do it. Let me read you one tweet, uh, finally, from President Trump uh, about this attack. Horrible and cowardly terrorist attack on innocent and defenseless worshipers in Egypt. The world cannot tolerate terrorism. We must defeat them militarily and, as you say, discredit the extremist ideology that forms the basis of their existence. Can they be defeated militarily? And can, Ambassador, we finally, or they, finally defeat their philosophy to stop this? It really is two different questions. Defeating them militarily at one level can be done, but we're seeing in the Sinai itself, many of those who may have been responsible for these attacks may have left Syria and Iraq. The more we succeed militarily in Syria and Iraq, the more we may find that smaller groups of those who were fighting for ISIS there basically relocate. And some of them are relocating in the Sinai. Those who previously were part of the ISIS-related groups in the Sinai had actually been killed. They're being replaced by those who seem to be more effective in terms of carrying out terror. So this is a long struggle militarily, but it also has to have, as you just pointed out, it has to have a philosophical component. It also has to have an economic component. You can't allow a vacuum to emerge. You need reconstruction in places where there's been great destruction. There needs to be good governance. Uh, one of the sources of alienation of, of people throughout the Middle East has been really terrible governance. If you want to ensure that there's not fertile ground for ISIS or al-Qaeda or the radical Islamists, you got to ensure that there is hope, a sense of possibility, uh, and that there's an economic future. All these things come together. You need what amounts to a comprehensive strategy if we're going to defeat them as a military element, it has an economic element, 
and it also has an ideological element that must come from Sunni Muslims. A sense of hope certainly is what is needed. Ambassador Dennis Ross, thank you. And uh, I want to point out to our viewers, you will be heard tomorrow morning on my uh, Fox News Rundown podcast. Just go to foxnews.com. It's the Fox News Rundown podcast. You get Ambassador Ross for like 15 minutes uh, and more analysis. Ambassador Ross, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Arthel? New details about the three Navy sailors who went missing after their plane crashed in the Philippine Sea last week. Brian Yenis has a live update coming up. Plus, online retailers hoping for a record-breaking Cyber Monday. One marketing expert will tell us how you can get the most bang for your buck. In the past, people would wait till they got to work to do their shopping uh, because they wanted their employer's high-speed Internet. Now your cell phone is just as fast as your employer's computer. So that's going to be dispersed over the holiday shopping period. But yet, there will be good sales on Cyber Monday.